Amen. Good morning, church. If you got your Bibles, and I hope you do, grab them. We're going to be in Acts chapter 15, Acts chapter 15. As you're turning there, I just want to uh, reiterate some of what Pastor Ben said. That, that video was to all of us as a church. I know my name was mentioned a lot, but we hadn't quite planted yet. And um, we're going to do, I hope, as a church, what Pastor Mark Driscoll just said, and keep it all about Jesus. Jesus is our hero. No senior pastor or lead pastor is our hero. No church name is our hero. No logo or brand is our hero. Jesus is our hero. And and what we wanted you to hear, though, is that that video was recorded last year in August and September. And when you have people like Pastor Mark Driscoll say about you, about our church, that you're going to grow, I counted it this time, very, very, very fast. He was very, very, very right, wasn't he? And so he is, he, he might be a prophet of God, and that's why God's blessing his church so much. And you need to also know, I know some of you are like, who are those guys? I don't know who those guys are, and I understand. But, but we have a crush on all those churches, okay? That's how that goes. These, it would be like, I don't know who the guy is in your industry, but that's the guy. Those are the dudes, all right? And, and it, it's like if you started a little computer uh, shop in, in a strip mall and Bill Gates sent you a video, you'd be like, what? That's, that's what happened to us. And so the elders played that for us as a staff um, the day before or the, the Thursday before we launched. And we just wanted to show that to you. Um, and it, it also just sets up what we're talking about today. So Grab your Bibles, Acts 15, beginning in verse 19. I'm going to pick that verse up. That's where we uh, started last week. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Last week, we rolled out the Restore Project. If you weren't here, um, then you were the only one because there was a lot of people here. So last week, we rolled out the Restore Project, and we talked about how uh, God is calling us to rebuild and restore the 25,000 square feet of unfinished Walmart space behind us as God continues to restore uh, men and women and students and children unto himself. And we are going to raise about $2.4 million over the next six months to pay for that thing. And so we need you to get involved in that. If you're a guest with us, uh, we don't expect anything from you, though we would not refuse. If you brought your checkbook and you can write a $2.4 million check, then we'll, I'll quit talking about it now. So we wouldn't refuse it, but... Uh, we, we said we ask you to go home and pray like crazy about what God would lead you to, to give and, and to invest uh, in, in what we're doing here at the Church 1122. And on your notes for the next couple of weeks, you'll be able to tear off the bottom right of your notes and, and uh, put your commitment card in one of these buckets at the end or any of the giving tables uh, around the room here. If you think, well, that's why I don't go to church because I always ask for money, then don't give a thing, okay? I'll pray that God will just soften your heart, and I would just encourage you, be generous somewhere. Support the Billy Graham uh, Association. Support his ministry. He's trustworthy and true and awesome, and so support them. But be generous somewhere. But if you're part of our family, we want you involved in this uh, Restore Project. If you gave to the Upon This Rock campaign, thank you, thank you, thank you. We're standing on your shoulders, so we don't expect anything out of you. We just want to say thank you to the Upon This Rock people. And then for the thousands of new families that are here, then uh, let's get involved in the Restore Project. Put that Commitment card, fill it out, and drop it here, all right? So that's what we talked about last week. Therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. There were, the gospel was going out, and people were getting saved, and including Gentiles. And so they had to get together in the church and talk about what it means to be saved. And let me just say that we are in a season of celebration in our church. How many of you got baptized last Sunday? Raise your hand big. Come on, man. We're here to celebrate you, too. Way to go, way to go, way to go. I, you just need to know from me, it was one of the high holy moments in ministry. This is my 20th year in ministry on church staff. And I know you're thinking, wow, you must have started when you were 11. Thank you. Uh, and, and it was one of the high holy moments of, of ministry ever, ever, ever. We got done here, hopped in the truck, loaded everybody up, got in that line to get in the hand apart. Was that crazy? That was crazy, wasn't it? And so uh, me, I was in line with about 2,000 of you and then... Got down to the ocean, went and prayed for our people, ran down to the beach, got out in the water. About the time I turned around, Ann Von Thron comes to get baptized. I look up to that lady so much. She loves Jesus. She's gospel saturated. I got some salt water in my eye. It got rough early and uh, baptized her. And then here they come. They're just coming, coming, coming. We're baptizing people on staff. I mean, it was amazing. I looked down the row and, and to look at the, the, the elders and the pastors and the staff that are baptizing people and the way we roll at 1122. Um, like husbands and wives were getting baptized together, so we dunk the husband, and then he'd go Ephesians 5 and dunk his wife, right? Who gets to baptize their wife? How cool is that? Or some mamas were baptizing their, their children. I mean, it was just, it felt biblical. And then you look up at the, 
you look at the o- I mean, at the beach with all those people, and it, I felt like I was in like a Charlton Heston movie or something, right? <laughs> like the water was going to part or something. I mean, it, it felt bigger than anything I've ever been a part of. It was amazing. In that moment, I just had this, uh, this little moment with the Lord after I baptized my last person, and I was just going from row to row just to encourage all the lines and and I began to think back about 10 years ago, about 10 years ago, Gretchen and I were doing ministry in Athens, Georgia, and we were just misaligned with the church. The way, the way they really viewed the Bible and, and the way they decided to do ministry was just different than the way, the way we do it. And, and it, things weren't just, they just weren't going well. And I was this close to tapping out. I really questioned, Lord, maybe I don't have what it takes to be successful in ministry. So I gave it a pretty good run, about 10 years. And so I, maybe it's time for me to move on to do something else. And I had this sweet job offer. This guy offered me as a job to be a motivational speaker. Um, and one of the clients was going to be Wrigley's Gum. And, and he offered a lot of money. And it, it was going to be awesome. And then as I was praying about it, I just thought, well, Lord, I'm pretty sure people are going to chew gum, whether you encourage them to or not, right? <laughs> and I don't know if I can spend the rest of my life talking about minty fresh breath. So all I can do is talk about Jesus. So we, we decided to come to Jacksonville and give it one last shot. And I know that God was going to do what he did last weekend with or without me. That's not the point. I'm not the point. But the point was I felt like God was saying, way to hang in there, way to persevere. If you'd have tapped out 10 years ago, you would have missed an opportunity to be a part of what I am doing in Jacksonville. And I say that just to tell you, some of you feel like you're at the end of the rope. Some of you feel like you're about to tap out and don't. Just hang in there. Hang in there. God, he knows the plans he has for you, declares the Lord. You don't know what they are yet, but he knows, okay? He's got your end in mind. He knows what's coming. And his plan is to prosper you and not to harm you and to give you a hope and a future. And he wants abundant life for you. He is a good dad. He is a good dad. And yea, though you walk through the valley of the shadow of death, you should fear no evil. For his rod and his staff comforts you. And don't you ever give up on a God who will never give up on you. And you hang in there because there might be pain in the night, but joy comes in the morning. Amen? All right, let's go. That wasn't even part of the thing, but let's do this. All right, 19. So, so it's been great. We've, had a, we've been celebrating like crazy. So last week, we talked about the gospel goes, Gentiles are getting saved, religious Jewish Christians are saying, I think these guys have to be Jewish before, before they become Christians, and specifically, they've got to be circumcised uh, and so then James, the brother of Jesus, says, therefore, my judgment is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God. Why? Because the gospel teaches us that it's not by any um, work that we get saved, but it's by grace through faith in Jesus. That is salvation and not of works. Verse 20, but, now here's a big but, which is going to sound like they're contradicting themselves, but we should write to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols, from sexual immorality, and from what has been strangled, and from blood. In other words, so we shouldn't make it difficult for the Gentiles that are coming to the Lord. However, let's write them a letter, and let's tell them there's three things that you've got to avoid. It looks like four, but it's really three. One, you need to avoid food sacrificed to idols. Secondly, you need to flee from sexual immorality. And thirdly, don't any, eat anything that's been strangled or has blood in it, all right? And the reason that's one for all you non-hunters, if you strangle your dinner, all the blood's still in it, all right? I know you get your dinner from Publix and it's blood-free, but if you're out in the woods and you kill it that way, it's still got the blood in it. <clears throat> the reason, the reason he's going to go through these three things, well, first one is don't eat food sacrificed to idols. Many of these uh, Gentile, new Gentile Christians, they are growing up in very pagan, very idolatrous communities. And so it was very common to take your food and to set it before a false god or an idol and dedicate it to the idol. But you would say, okay, idol, I dedicate all this food to you, and whatever you leave as leftovers, then I'll get to eat that. Deal, deal. And it's amazing how much a false idol leaves as leftovers. It's like all of it. <laughs> so essentially what, uh, what James is saying is, hey, if you were coming out of that kind of background, Paul clears it up in 1 Corinthians 8 that food sacrificed to an idol is not a sin, but it's a gray area. And so there's some people that need to avoid those situations because you're coming out of that kind of lifestyle, and you definitely need a season away from that. Coach Bull Lee, the great prophet from Dillon, South Carolina, he would say, if you don't want to fall down, don't walk in slippery places. So that's the gray area. Avoid the gray area. Secondly, they want to point out to avoid or abstain from sexual immorality. Now, the, the, the Gentile Christians, they grew up in this very pagan 
society, and they believed in this false dichotomy of the human self. They believed that their body was like one entity, and your spirit, soul, heart was a completely separate entity. So what was very common in the first century, um, particularly in places like Corinth, you would get these people that had become Christians, and they would say, I've given my heart and my soul to Jesus. So they'd go to church on the weekends, and they'd sing with their hands up and know all the words, and they would say, I've given my heart to Jesus, but on the, during the week, I'm going to go to the pagan temple, and I'm going to give other parts of my body to the temple prostitutes. But that's just my body. It doesn't matter what I do with my body, because my soul, I've given to Jesus. And so Paul addresses that in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, and he says, do you not know that your body is the temple of the Holy Spirit? Which, by the way, has nothing to do with what you look like in a bikini. Can I get an amen? That's what I thought. It's a real high-pitched amen, wasn't it? So, uh, but what it means is that the Holy Spirit lives in you, and so wherever the Holy Spirit or wherever God lives, that's the temple. And so what Paul was trying to help the, the first century Christians believe is there's no dichotomy of self here. It's just you. So you can't just give your soul to Jesus and give your other parts to the temple prostitutes. It's, it's all or nothing. He's either Lord of all or he's not Lord at all. And, and uh, sexual sin is in a category all by itself. The Bible says all sins a man commits are outside of his body, but he who sins sexually sins against his own body. It's just a different it doesn't mean that you can't be saved from it. It doesn't mean that Christ didn't die uh, for our sins and cleanse us of all unrighteousness. But when someone sins sexually, it's at a soul level that's just different than other sin. And so when they're writing this letter to these new Gentile Christians, they're saying, yes, you're saved by grace through faith, but you better avoid sexual immorality. It will get you in a ditch uh, like no other sin will. In fact, in, fact, in 1 Corinthians 6... What the, what the Bible wants us to do when it comes to being tempted sexually is flee sexual immorality. Flee. That's Hebrew for turn and run away, okay? Flee sexual immorality. The same guy, Paul, that wrote those words, flee sexual immorality, he says um, in Ephesians chapter 6, stand firm against the devil and his many schemes. Think about this for a second. The Bible would have us believe that if on our way out to your car after this service is over... If Beelzebub himself is waiting for you at your car, pitchfork, horns, the tail, I'll get you. You know, the whole deal that you're supposed to stand firm against the devil and his many schemes, suit up in the armor of God and tell him things like, greater is he who is in me than he who is in the world. Stand firm against the devil. But if you were to walk out to your car and your ex-girlfriend is out there with a short skirt, you're supposed to turn and run away. <laughs> Flee. Stand firm against Satan. Run from sexual immorality. That's how big of a deal this is. So uh, avoid food sacrifice to idols. Why? Because it's a gray area. You need a season away from that. Secondly, um, flee sexual immorality. It's just a big, big deal. You need to flee from that. And then the third thing is about the blood. Don't eat your steaks medium rare, which I would think, what? Somebody's got to explain that. So <laughs> he says, don't eat what's been strangled and from blood. Well, here's the thing. Again, He's talking to Gentile Christians, and they are about to be grafted into the church, the family of God, who primarily is made up of men and women who were born and raised Jewish. And all throughout the Hebrew Scriptures, all throughout the Old Testament, really from Genesis chapter 3 all the way through Malachi, one of the primary themes that runs through all of the Bible is blood. And not just to be gory, but it was a precursor, it was, it was pointing to the Lamb of God who comes to take away the sin of all mankind. You see, it's why God instituted this sacrificial system. So for all these Jewish brothers and sisters' days, they grew up in this sacrificial system where blood was shed for the covering of sin. And so they equated this bloodshed with the coming Messiah. And so James would say to the Gentile Christians, well, now the Lamb has come, the Lamb has uh, shed His blood on the cross, and so, can we just not eat blood around or anywhere, but especially because it's going to mess up our Jewish brothers and sisters. He goes on to say why he wants them to avoid these three things. Verse 21, for, for, that, that's a big reason. You're going to avoid these three things. Why? For, from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. In other words... He spent the first half of Acts 15 talking to the Jews about the Gentiles. 
And what he's saying to the Jewish Christians is, let's not make it difficult for the Gentiles who are coming to the Lord. And now in this letter, he's going to turn and look at the Gentile Christians, and he's really talking on behalf of his Jewish Christian brothers and sisters and saying, hey, now Gentiles, and let's not make it difficult for your Jewish brothers and sisters who you're going to be joined together with in the church. So if you could just avoid these things, you're going to do that so that our church can be unified because those are some areas that will just tear us apart. In other words, Gentile Christians, can we just all agree you're not the point? It's not all about you. Can we just honor somebody else for a minute? Can we not stand up and talk about, you can't tell me how to order my steak. I'll order my steak however I want to. Well, not if you're a Christian because you have died to yourself. It's no longer you who live, but Christ that lives in you. And so dead people don't have rights. And so you are, for the sake of honoring your brothers and sisters in Christ, for the sake of unity within the church, if you would just think about them in regards to these things, instead of thinking about yourself, you will do well. The Bible talks about honor all throughout scriptures. And let me just speak to, especially if you're, in, if you're like my age, if you're in the 40 and under generation, and I'm not quite 40, okay, I'm a long ways from 40, actually. I've got till September, all right, that's a, that's a long ways. You don't believe me, you hold your breath till September and come talk to me when you get there, all right? So, but the 40 and under crowd, we, we live in a uh, really kind of a, an honor deficient society, don't we? I mean, I, I'm not sure what happened, but it is not hip to honor anybody. It's hip to be critical. It's hip to, to uh, tear people down. By the way, it takes very little intelligence. It takes very little maturity to just be critical and negative about other people. And I believe that that God wants us individually and particularly us as a church to, to create and walk in a culture of honor. I mean, the Bible talks about it like crazy. In Galatians chapter 5, Paul says this, For you were called to freedom, brothers. Only do not use your freedom as an opportunity for the flesh, but through love serve one another. For the whole law is fulfilled in one word. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. But if you bite and devour one another, watch out that you are not consumed by one another. And so James is saying, okay, listen, what we want you to do for the sake of our Jewish brothers and sisters in whom we are about to be grafted into the same family, into the same church, we're going to avoid these things just because we're going to honor them in the name of Jesus. He goes on in verse 22. Then it seemed good to the apostles and to the elders with the whole church. So the whole church is unified in this. To choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. So they write out this letter. Here's the letter they write. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles, in Antioch and Syria and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instruction. So let me just mention real quick. Um, this doesn't mean that we're all just going to hold hands and sing kumbaya regardless of the doctrine you preach, all right? There are things there that are outside doctrinal borders and theological borders that would be heresy. And as a shepherd, the shepherd is supposed to lead, care for, and know the flock, also identify the wolf and take him out. That's a part of it. Right? That is a part of it. And so they do want these guys to know what these men, these pharisaical Christians were teaching, that you have to be circumcised to be saved, that was not the gospel. They are not a part of us. So there are some borders here. Verse 25, it has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, again, see the unity here, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas, who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth, for it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit. And it's always good to have him on your side when you're writing a letter to the churches. For it seemed, to, it seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than these requirements. Now, at this point, as they were reading the letter to the churches, you, every man in the auditorium was scooted up on the edge of the pew, leaning in, trying to figure out if he was coming back to church next week, right? Because you remember what they just discussed in the first part of Acts 15 is, do you have to be circumcised in order to be a Christian? And so he had all the guys' attention, all right? It was like, it was like high attendance dude day because they wanted to know if they were coming back next week. And now, here are the requirements. Verse 29. 
that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. So they just go through those three things. Okay, here's the three things we want you to avoid. And if you keep yourself from these, you will do well. Farewell. In other words, can we just honor somebody else? Listen, Gentile Christians, it's not all about you. Can we just honor someone else? Our Jewish brothers and sisters that have surrendered their life to Jesus Christ, they've been saved by the same grace that you've been saved by. And now, let's not use your newfound freedom to make it all about you. The Bible talks about honor like crazy. And I want to be the kind of church, I want this to be the kind of church that, is, that, that has a culture of honor. The Bible says this in Romans 12, 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Did you know that we are supposed to honor one another like it's a competition? Like, I'm not supposed to cut you down and tear you down. What I'm supposed to do is try to out honor you. And let's just be honest, our society could use another dose of honor. Could it not? Could we not honor our military a little more? Could we not honor our teachers a little more? Could we not honor the police officers and the firefighters and the first responders? Could we not honor, like the Bible says, our mother and father a little more? Could this not just be a place of more and more honor? How do you ever go wrong by honoring one another? And a lot of times people are like, no, 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 but I need to correct that person. Well, you might need to, but the only way you're going to gain influence over somebody is to honor them. It is hard to change the mind of your enemy. It's a lot easier to change the mind of one of your friends whom you have honored. And in fact, all throughout the Bible, the Bible talks about honor. In, in, uh, in Ephesians chapter 5, the Bible says, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And it's going to talk about three types of relationships where there's somebody in authority and somebody under authority. And the overarching verse is 521, submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. In other words, it's a lot like Romans says, that you should try to out-honor one another. And then in, in 522, it, it, it quotes, or it, Paul writes, your favorite verse, wives, do you want to all say it together with me? Wives, submit to your husbands as unto the Lord. Didn't that just have a beautiful sound, right? I didn't hear you. Amen. You're single. Yeah. Single guy on the front. They're single for a season, single for a reason, okay? So, uh, <laughs> submit to one another out of reverence for Christ. And then, and then it, it sums it up with wives should submit to their husbands in everything. So, wives, if you're ever wondering, say, am I supposed to submit to my husband in this? You just go, does it fall under the everything category? Well, do you know what? It does. The point is this, is that the Bible's not even telling you to honor your husband because he's honorable. Because I know your husband, he ain't that honorable, right? But... Christ is the one that decided he would be the head of your house, and because of that, you would honor him. And then it turns, on, it turns to husbands. It says, husbands, love your wives. Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Husbands, did you know that, that your marriage is all about you honoring your wife? And how far do you take it? You love her like Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. And if, and if you come back with this week, yeah, but she, well, you know what you do? And Jesus went to the cross for you. Look, you can be right or you can be a husband. It's up to you. Jesus could have been right or he could have been the Savior. He could have lined us all up and went center, 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 hell, hell, hell. But he didn't. He went to the cross and took responsibility for something that was not his fault. How honoring is that for us? And so how far do you take it, husband? How far do you take honoring your wife? You take it all the way to the cross. If it kills you, then that's how far you take it, which is good news because you only promise till death do us part anyway, and then you're out, Okay. <laughs> And then right after that, it goes to the, the parent-child relationship, same thing. Kids, honor your father and mother. Fathers and mothers, do not exasperate your kids. There's mutual honor there. Then it goes to slave and bond servant, which in our context would, would best be understood as employer and employee. And to the employer, God says, don't act like you're the master, because you all have the same master, it ain't you, right? So do you honor your employees? And to the employer, it says, you better work hard, because you're not working for this guy. You honor him because God gave you your boss. So we could probably spend all morning just on that one there. Are you honoring the person that employs you? The Bible talks about honor all throughout the scripture. And the idea here is that, is that we outdo one another in showing honor. And so that's what this letter to the Gentiles is about. Hey, can we just honor our brothers and sisters that have been around a little bit longer than us Gentiles? Can we just honor some of their traditions and honor them and not, not use our freedom as a stumbling block for them? And so you get to verse 30. So 
When they were sent off, they went down to Antioch, and having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter, and when they read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. So when they heard this, just avoid these three things, and you'll do well, all right? You're saved by grace. The gospel is that Jesus died on the cross for your sin. There's nothing else that needs to be added to that for your salvation. You surrender your life to Christ, and you are saved. Now, because of that, let's honor our brothers and sisters for the sake of unity in the church. And so the Bible says that the way these early Christians responded to that is they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. I want this to be the kind of church where we encourage and strengthen each other with our words. Because let's think about it. These days, most of the times, words are used to tear down to demolish, to critique and criticize. I mean, that's, think of one TV show or one arena where the show, the entertaining value is about encouragement and lifting up. Isn't it almost always just about, about tearing down? I mean, whatever it is, even what's called news. These, remember when news used to just be like they would report the stuff? Not anymore. Not anymore. There, there's every kind of news outlet that you want to see that says whatever you want them to say, and all they do is critique and criticize. And the same thing can be true in church, but not in our church. This will not be a place where we critique and criticize other ministries and other pastors and other churches. We want to be the kind of church that uses words to encourage and strengthen the brothers with many words. In fact, if you can go ahead and start grabbing. You can open up your notes, and inside of your notes, there is a letter because we want to do what the Bible says to do. The Bible says they delivered the letter, and when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. That's what we're going to do by the end of this service. And I want to tell you why. When, before we launched the Church of 1122, we decided as elders and a staff and pastors, we got together and we said, we want to be the kind of church that encourages and strengthens other brothers. And the reason is because we have been so honored, we have been so strengthened, and we have been so encouraged by other churches. And I'm going to tell you, when these other churches were encouraging us, like when those guys filmed that video and sent it to us, we weren't even a church yet. We were just a service at another church. First and foremost, the church that honored us more than anybody else is Beach United Methodist Church, Pastor Jerry Sweat. All next week, the entire sermon is going to be like a behind-the-scenes look at the launch of the Church of 1122 and what he went through and what that church did and how we got to that place and how God has blessed both ministries. And so next week, we're going to spend the entire time talking about, about Beach and about Pastor Jerry and, and, and the fact that we wouldn't be here without them. But I want to tell you about some other churches that have honored us and, and been a, a model or a picture of what it looks like to honor other people. One is Celebration Church. Celebration Church and Pastor Stovall Weems. Um, from the very beginning, as soon as Pastor Stovall heard that we were launching the Church of 1122, he called me up and said, can I take you to lunch? And, and, and I know you don't know this, but in church world, Pastor Stovall is a big deal. I mean, he is a really big deal. He, you know, he's on book tours and speaks at the biggest conferences. And I mean, he's just a big deal. And then out of nowhere, he calls me up. Can I take you to lunch? I'm, yes, sir. And I go to lunch with him. And we go to Salt Life uh, right next door to Beach. And we're sitting there and we can see the cross on top of BUMC right there. And he looks at me and he points at Beach and he says, you honor that pastor in that church in this season, and God will honor you and your church in the next. The way you exit this season of ministry will determine how you enter the next season of ministry, all right? And I'm going to tell you, I felt like I was sitting with Ezekiel or something. I was like, what? I mean, he could have went, thus saith the Lord, and called down fire from heaven. But there's, there's not a week that goes by that Celebration doesn't send one of their staff people over here to help us with stuff. I mean, week after week, they help in tech, and they help set stuff up, and about a month ago, Pastor Stovall comes to our, our, uh, our staff meeting just to pour into and teach our staff. Do you know what kind of waiting list there is to get Pastor Stovall to come preach at a conference or something because he's, he's in such high demand? And, and I'm telling you, he just pours into us. Almost every time we get a letter or, a, or an email from Celebration Church, it will, it will often say, we love our Church of 1122 family. I mean, they honor us like crazy. And what I, one of the things I love about it, what, what, what 1122 and Celebration have in common is we love Jesus and we believe the Bible. But it, we're very different kinds of churches. I mean, 
we, we are different. I don't know if you've been to Celebration, all right, but their church is called the Arena. I, I don't know if you've been to the Arena, but it's amazing. I mean, it is amazing. It's huge, and it's like, and it's smoke and laser light show, and, and like, you know, a, a, a helicopter might drop from the ceiling and shoot a rocket out above the crowd, and it goes, Jesus, right? And it's awesome. <laughs> awesome. And, and we're at Walmart. Right? But it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. And let me tell you what, but Celebration and Pastor Stovall, they're not threatened. They're not threatened because we're growing faster. All we are fast. They just come in and help. On Easter Sunday, we ran out of little stickers for the parents. Guess who we call? Celebration. Pastor John Wyatt runs her kids' ministry over there. Oh, yeah, we'll bring you stickers. Boom, we get stickers. Because they're not threatened. They didn't lean in and be like, well, if y'all come to our church, we don't run out of stickers at our church at the arena. No, they come in here and they help. Why? Because I'll tell you, Celebration, are, they're outdoing us in honor. And, and they're a big deal, all right? And Pastor Stovall, he and some families moved here 17 years ago, and they started that church in his living room, okay? And so we, we will not be critical of other pastors in this town or anywhere. We will not. We will support and pray for and celebrate what's happening at Celebration and a bunch of other churches. Just a few more, because I love it. Pastor Mark Driscoll, um, you know, he did that video. I don't know if you guys know who Pastor Mark Driscoll is. He, he's got to be the busiest pastor in the United States. He's got... He started a church in, uh, in Seattle, Washington, just because it was so unchurched. Now it's 17 campuses over four states. It's 20, 30,000 people at his church. He's got a New York Times best-selling book about marriage called Real Marriage. He was on The View the other day, all right? Gretchen told me that. I don't watch The View, all right, but she told me. <laughs> First time I ever met Pastor Mark Driscoll was last summer at this little conference thing. Somebody introduced us, and he spent time with me and Gretchen. And, and Gretchen is never impressed by, like, because somebody's got a big church. She walked away from that meeting going, man, I felt like he'd been waiting all week to spend time with us. That's how he treated us, right? And on Easter, the night before Easter Sunday, I get a text. I get a text. Pastor Joby, praying for you and your church tomorrow. Jesus has handed you his word and his people because he trusts you. I know it's going to be a great day with the Holy Spirit at work, Mark Driscoll. And I think, who has time... I don't even have time to text my brother back. How in the world is he texting me all over here? And we're nobody, we're nothing. You know what he's doing? That church is, is honoring us. They're outdoing us in honor. Or uh, Pastor Matt Chandler, he's the president of the Acts 29 network. We're a part of that network. He's probably the most uh, downloaded sermon podcast guy out there right now. If you want a great, great preacher to listen to, uh, uh, download Matt Chandler. He's amazing. And so just about three weeks ago, our elders, our whole elder board was invited out to the village church, Matt Chandler's church. And their, their elders told our elders, just come on out. Just come on, spend the weekend with us. And we don't know if we can tell you how to do what you need to do, but we'll show you the potholes we ran into and maybe you can avoid those. I'm telling you, they are outdoing us with honor. When we were figuring out how to build this place, there's a church in Charlotte, North Carolina called Elevation Church with Pastor Stephen Ferdy. Again, if you were to go to Elevation Church, it would be different in style than this. Uh, we pull up to their church. They had, built, they had taken an old uh, shopping center kind of thing and turned it into a church like us. And when we pulled up, I'm telling you, it looks like a laser tag arena. It's like, doo, doo, you know, and it's orange and it's smoke. It's crazy. And we pulled into that place, and I'm just going to tell you, they honored us. They, everybody on their team just put their schedules aside for a day just to help this, this little church plant who hadn't even planted yet. Helped us. Anything we needed. Another one's North Point Community Church. Andy Stanley has a bazillion. He's like the Pope of Evangelicals. All right, he writes a book every weekend, and, and, and he's got churches everywhere. And he's got a campus in Athens called Athens Church. And so it used to be a Sam's Club or a Sam's Club. And so Pastor Ryan set us up for, to take a tour through that church. They didn't just tour us. Their entire staff cleans their calendar off that day to just meet with any of us about anything. Why? Because they weren't threatened by us. It wasn't about that. Because of their maturity and their love for Jesus, they did what the Bible says, and they, they said, we're going to outdo one another in showing honor. And so that's the kind of church we're going to be. That's, gonna, that's the church we're going to be. So listen, if you got beat up and bumped and bruised by your last church and you're here because they, they messed you up, I, okay, I'm sorry. 
but shake off the dust. We're not criticizing another ministry in town, okay? We are going to join together in the name of Jesus and under the authority of his word for his glory, and we're not trying to make much of us. The reason we're going to outdo one another in honor is because Jesus is our hero, not a preacher or anything else. And so these churches have demonstrated and modeled what this looks like for us. So when we started, we said, that's the kind of church we want to be. We want to outdo one another with honor. And so we have decided, as a church of 1122, we decided before we ever launched that we were going to tithe on our budget. So when you tithe, when you give your tithes and offerings, you know, we don't pass the plate here, but you, you go to the kiosk or you go to the giving boxes around the side, then, then we take 10% of that and we fuel other ministries other than ourselves. And part of the reason is because we, we want our church to be reminded that we're not the point. That, that God's, all of God's work isn't right here at the church of 1122. Do we celebrate what he's doing here? Oh my goodness, yes. I'm blown away every day that I even get to be a part of this movement. But we don't want to be a cul-de-sac of stupidity. We want to be a conduit of God's blessing, just like we ask you to do in your family. And so 10%. So this year we'll, we'll give $350,000 to other ministries and a part of it is just a reminder that we're all in one team that this one name where every knee will bow and his name is Jesus not 1122 and so that's what we do and so you've got these letters in your in your bulletin I want you to get them out and we are going to do what the Bible says and we're going to deliver these letters and when they read it when these pastors and churches read it we want them to rejoice because of its encouragement and so we wanted you to know who you're writing to. So I'm going to share with you some of the ministries and church plants that we are supporting. First one is Pastor Bill Lackey, Revolve Church in New Jersey. Um, his wife is Gina. He's got a little baby girl named Emma. They launched on March, in March of 2012 with four people. And I'm pretty sure three of the four are in the picture right here, okay? But since that day, they've grown to about 40 people, and on the same day that we were baptizing, they baptized seven people. Is that not awesome? Amen, amen. Here's what's great. We've, not only are we going to write them letters and pray for them, but we support them financially in a very, very significant way. And so one of, one of the best days I've had as a pastor is I got to call all these pastors I'm going to introduce you to, and on the phone, I got to tell them, hey, listen, Jesus has anointed you, God believes in you, and so do we. And we're, not, we're, we're going to pray for you, yes and amen. And in addition to that, we're going to give you, especially when you've got a church of 40, we're going we're to support a significant portion of your budget. And so Bill Lackey, he thinks he's so tough, right? Because if you're a church planner, you better be tough. And, and he just breaks down crying. Every one of these guys I called on the phone, they all just broke down crying. And if I didn't work out so much, I probably would have cried too, but I work out. If I was. <laughs> and so Pastor Bill Lackey tells me that just, just two days before that, their elders had found a new place for the church because they had been meeting in his home and they'd outgrown his home with 40 people and they found this little storefront and they had enough money to rent it for two months and they didn't know how they were going to pay for the rest of the year. And the amount of money that you gave that our church just sent their way was enough to cover their lease for the rest of the year. Amen. Isn't that cool? <laughs> And because, because they were able to do that, then they were, they've already taken their first mission trip to Honduras to put in clean drinking water for those places. That's a church that, uh, uh, that started with four people. Next is a guy named Jay Bowman, Pastor Jay Bowman. He's the uh, pastor of the Church of the Redeemer. He also runs a ministry called Restore Brazil. He is in Rio down in Brazil. His wife is named Lucianne. He's got a daughter named Sophia and a daughter named Olivia they launched on March the 24th of 2013, and they have already grown their church to about 70 people. This past weekend, they baptized four of those people. Pastor Jay partners with us in all of our ministries in Brazil. If you're going to Rio, then you're going to be serving at Pastor Jay's church. If you come with me to Cadeau, Pastor Jay is flying up from Rio to do a pastor's conference for the church that we are planting in Cadeau. Uh, number three is Pastor Matt Jensen with the Image Church. Pastor Matt is married to Amy, and they have two little boys. Uh, one little boy is named Knox, and the other is Cash. So they'll either be rock stars or pro wrestlers. Those are their, <laughs> where they're going. Knox and Cash. They launched this January with 15 people, and since then they have grown to about 100 folks at the Image Church. Um, now, the Image Church is in Jacksonville. They planted downtown in the Springfield area. And I have heard people, I've had people come to me and say, well, I understand supporting planting churches in other countries, but how could you support a church plant right here in your own city? 
I mean, well, well, you act like we're not on the same team, Hoss, all right? I would plant a church on the other end of the parking lot right here if we could, all right? We'd plant one in this room, right? That we will, we, we're going to be a church that's about planting gospel-centered churches. And so Pastor Matt, is a, he's a, an incredible leader, very dynamic, and they've grown to 100, and they don't even have a, a band yet, okay? They're, they're still trying to figure out how to do music in their church and exactly what that's going to look like. They are intentionally multicultural and are trying to do that, so he asked that we would pray for them as they figure out uh, what, how, how they're going to uh, worship God in music there. The next one is Pastor Adam Flint. He's at the Crossings Church. This is also one in the Jacksonville area. Um, he's just south of us in St. John's County. They meet at a, at a middle school, I think. Uh, his wife is named Kristen. His son is Gavin, and his daughter is Sophia. They launched in January of last year, and their current attendance is about 175 people. And what's great here is the money that, that we uh, support them with, they were able to add another staff person to get their small groups ministry going and staff. And not only do we send them uh, financial support, but I sent them my brother and sister-in-law. My brother and sister-in-law used to attend here, but they live down pretty close to where this church is. And I was like, Russ, Shannon, why don't you just go to that church? It's a gospel-centered church. And now my brother builds all the sets, all the things that they decorate their stage with, and my sister-in-law runs all of their missions uh, ministry and takes leads all of their mission trips. And so that's Adam Flint with Crossing Church. And then number five is, is some homegrown folks. It's uh, Tyler and Leave Workman with Akoa Refuge. And they have, uh, they have a lot of kids. They have Esther, Shamila, uh, Gideon, and Judah. And not only do they run the Akoa Orphanage, um, but they, they also run something called the Akoa Revival Bible School. And they've launched about 30 churches in the remote villages of Masaka. And these are, um, these are graduates of the Bible school that are pastors. And so I've taught in that Bible school before and will teach in there again. And in addition to launching all those churches, they also run the Okoa uh, Orphanage, which has about 80 kids in the program. Many have been victims of rape, abuse, others abandoned, orphaned by AIDS, etc., these are kids abandoned by everybody but Jesus, Akoa, and, you know, we love those children too. And so these are some of the people that we want to honor, honor, honor. And I can tell you by planting a church uh, that's gone about as good as it can go, that there are those days when you begin to think, God, Lord, do I have what it takes? And you have no idea what it would be like to receive a letter from somebody in the church of 1122 just saying, Brothers and sisters, hang in there. We believe in you. God is in charge. He is faithful. And so that's what we're going to do. We're going to write these letters as letters of encouragement. And here's why. A big reason why. Can I just quote Jesus for a second? Jesus in John 17, he's praying what's called the high priestly prayers, his longest recorded prayer. At first, he prays for the disciples that are, that are right there. And then, and then he kind of transitions and he says this. He says, I do not ask for these only. Talking about the guys here but also for those who will believe in me through their word. So he's praying for us. You get that? That they, that's us, that they may all be one just as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they also may be in us so that the world may believe that you have sent me. The thing Jesus prayed for more than anything else was not an explosion of churches because he said he would build the church, so he had that part handled. You know what he prayed for? Unity. He prayed for unity in the church so that the whole world may know. That the world would look at the way brothers and sisters that call themselves Christians, brothers and sisters that claim Jesus as their common Lord, they would look at the way we treat one another, and that would set them on a trajectory either towards the Lord or away from Him. You want, you want your mind to explode for a second? Think about this. This is the only prayer that Jesus ever prayed that you and I can answer. So sometimes I just kind of think, when the church says, God, why won't you answer my prayer? Sometimes I think God could lean in and go, well, why don't you answer mine? I pray that you would be one so that the whole world may know. And, and it starts by honoring, by valuing one another. And so that's what we're going to do. That's what they did. That's what this letter to the churches was about in verse 33. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to those who had sent, sent them. Peace in, in Greek does not mean lack of conflict. Peace means wholeness. And so this letter, this community, it brought wholeness. 
And then it says, but Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many also. On September 22nd, uh, our staff and many volunteers were here going crazy. It was the day before we launched. We launched on September 23rd. And to say that the launch went well would be the understatement of all understatements in the church world, okay? I mean, it's just God has done what God wants to do, and I don't know why, but we're favored by him, and, and thank Jesus. But it still doesn't mean it wasn't hard work. And so, especially that week leading up to the day we launched, we were working and working and working and trying to get this place ready for you because, because we want to honor you. If you come to church here, we want to honor you. It's why we have parking attendants. Did you know we've heard that some people can get into a parking lot without an attendant? But now here at the Church of 1122, we will show you exactly what spot you get to park in. And there are some people that can open their own door, but not at the Church of 1122. We are going to open your door for you and hand you a bulletin and say hello 73 times before you get from the parking lot to your seat. All right? <laughs> Why? Because we think you're kind of a big deal. All right? We want to value you. And so we're trying to get ready for opening day. And we had, my dad was in town. He looked through here like on a Tuesday and said, well, I don't believe y'all going to make it, right? I mean, it did not look like we were about to move in. And so we're working like dogs to get everything ready. I mean, working like dogs. And the Friday night before the Sunday morning we opened, there were some people in here till I mean, midnight, 1 o'clock, and we weren't finished. And my team looked at me, and they looked tired. And, and um, you may have been able to figure this out about me, but I drive our team pretty hard, especially certain seasons. You know, I throttle down. And I don't mind manipulating you with some Bible verses, right? You love Jesus, I love Jesus, all right? Jesus died on the cross. You can get up Saturday morning and be back here. You know, I, that's kind of what I do. And you see everybody going, ah, what am I going to say to that? All right, so, a little amen from, okay. So, so our team shows up here on Saturday morning tired, tired. And I know opening day, it looked good, but it's kind of like when somebody's in your neighborhood and they call them, like, hey, we're in the neighborhood, we're going to stop by. And you're like, great, that'd be great. We'd love to have you over. You hang up and you look at the kids and go, clean up the house now. And everybody's running around cleaning, cleaning, cleaning. And you answer the door sweating. Why are you sweating? Oh, we're just waiting on you, but you know. And you only clean up the parts everybody can see, you know. And living room looks great, but if you open the kids' doors, something might fall on your head. That's how it was here. This room looked great, new gym was great, the lobby was good, but if you were to open one of these doors, we'd probably lost you forever, all right? <laughs> Saturday morning, we get here, and I mean, I'm telling you, we're, we're going to huddle up and pray up here in the lobby, and it's the, you know, last little sprint, and a car pulls up, two vans pull up, and out come some people, and we're all looking at each other on staff, like, who are these people? Anybody know these people? Oh, no, I don't know them, you know them, we don't know them, and then this guy kind of appears through the middle. And it's Spike Hogan, Pastor Spike Hogan, Chet's Creek Church. Chet's Creek is just really one road over behind us here. Uh, a, a few families and Pastor Spike started that church about 10 years ago. It's an incredible church. It's a thriving church. Uh, it's a mega church, big church, a couple thousand people. They have beautiful facilities. And this is September. And in church world, you grow in September and in January. So if you're a big old mega church, you ain't got time for anything but what's going on in your church. Except Pastor Spike and about 12 people from his church. They come walking in like Hannibal in the A-team right through the front door. <laughs> and he opens the door with his big old smile. I think I'd only met Pastor Spike maybe one time up to that point. And he just would, I mean, just with a big smile, he just says, So I hear we're launching a church. How can we help? And folks, instead of being jealous, instead of being insecure, None of that. None of that. And so their team came in this room, helped us arrange these chairs. And it ain't like arranging chairs in your living room. It ain't just three. Well, I'll try that one over there. There's 1,750 chairs. If you move these three right here and you start spacing them, I mean, the ripple effect will make you say bad words. You're like, oh, my God, right? <laughs> Kill you. <laughs> pastor Spike, senior pastor of the mega church, Chet's Creek. Pastor Spike and his team, they come in here, and they, he gets on his hands and knees, and with, a, with some cloth, he wipes the dust. He dusts the legs and the seats of every seat in this chair. I walked in here one time, and that man is sweating like a dog. Baptist pr preacher. You know he's paid his dues all these years. He didn't have to do that. But you know what he does? He just decided that his love would be genuine. And that he would outdo us in honor. 
And folks, that's Chet's Creek Church. And that's Celebration Church. And that's Beach United Methodist Church. And the list goes on and on and on. And that's the Village Church. And that's Mars Hill Church. And that's all these other churches. And so we are going to be a kind of church that honors one another. That honors one another. We're going to honor each other in here. All right? So like on your way in and out sometimes, maybe you should say thanks to the people that are holding the door or working in the parking lot. Or when you go pick up your kids, you go, I know he preaches too long every time. Thanks for watching my kids a little bit longer. Or maybe you lean over to the person next to you and be like, I know we've been worshiping Jesus for like six months together and we've never said hi. Hi, how are you? You'd honor one another. We have a culture of honor in this place. Also, how about we write a letter of encouragement just like the Bible says? And so when they receive it, they would be encouraged I, I want us as a church to start praying that God might use the church of 1122 as a unifying agent in the city of Jacksonville for all kind of different churches. I mean, as long as they love Jesus and are under the authority of God's word, just like Revelation 1, 2, they love Jesus and are under the authority of God's word, then we are looking forward to, to stacking hands with those churches because he's our hero, not any particular church or any particular pastor. And then lastly, we need you to get on board with the Restore Project so that we can always be in a position to be a conduit of blessing so that we can outdo other churches in honor. And so the way we're going to close is the band's going to come and you're going to get your letter out and you are going to pray like crazy that the Spirit of God would give you just the right words to write down to that pastor and his family and to his church. Some of you, some of you need to write to the wife of over the pastor's name that you got. All right? Some of you, why? And you just need to write her a word of encouragement. Some of you need to write to the church. Some of you need to write to that pastor. And I want you to, I just want you to pour out words of encouragement and honor to these other churches as our band sings. And then, and then when I say amen, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to say amen. When you get finished writing that letter, then you get up from wherever you are. You come down. You can drop it in these buckets. You can put it on the, uh, on the stairs. If you're afraid to come down front, you can go out the back and put them in the uh, offering boxes or hand them to the one of the ushers on the way out. But let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, I thank you so much. God, I thank you so much that you demonstrated your love for us in this, that while we were yet still sinners, that you died on the cross. God, I thank you that our value, our value is determined by what, by what someone would pay for us and that we are not our own. We were bought at a price. And the price that you were willing to pay for us was your son, Jesus. And God, I thank you that that wasn't about us. It was about you. It's about who you are. And God, thank you that we have been purchased by the blood. God, would you just constantly remind us it's not about us. Lord, may our attitude be the same as that of Christ Jesus, who being in very nature God did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself, made himself nothing. God, may this church never be full of itself. May we empty ourselves for the sake of the gospel. God, we thank you and we praise you for godly men like Pastor Spike Hogan, and Pastor Matt Chandler, and Pastor Mark Driscoll, and Pastor Stovall Weems, and Pastor Jerry Sweat, and all of these other men who, out of maturity and a love for you, have poured into us. And Lord, may you position us to be the kind of church that pours into other churches. And God, may this be a place of honor because we honor you. We love you, Jesus, and pray in your name. Amen. Right here.